Hello, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's event. My name is Mark Elliott. I'm Professor of Public Law at the University of Cambridge and Chair of the Faculty of Law. And it's my honour to welcome you all to uh, this event to celebrate the, the Prathiva M. Singh Cambridge Scholarships. Um, we're joined, I understand, by more than a thousand uh, guests um, on this call from around the world. Um, and it's wonderful that we can um, extend this uh, celebration to such a wide uh, group of, of, of friends and supporters. Um, so the purpose of today's event is to, is to celebrate and to mark uh, the, the annual award of these, these scholarships. Very sadly, we couldn't hold an event last year due to the pandemic, um, and we're delighted to be uh, holding this um, online event uh, this year. Um, the purpose of these scholarships is to enable uh, talented Indian students to take up LLM places at Cambridge, um, and we'll be hearing from some of the, the scholars uh, during uh, this, uh, this afternoon's event. We have a number of distinguished uh, guests with us this afternoon who I'll be introducing uh, during the course of the event. Um, in particular, um, I'm delighted to welcome Justice Prathiba M. Singh, um, our chief guest, Mr. Fanny Nariman, and Dr. Nikhil Tandon. And from Cambridge, I'm delighted to welcome the Vice Chancellor, Professor Stephen Toop, uh, Professor Henning Grosarusa Khan, who directs our LLM program, um, and Helen Tennant from the Cambridge Trust. So I'll hand over now uh, to the Vice Chancellor, who is going to offer some words of welcome and introduction. Thank you very much, Mark, and a warm welcome to you, Prataba. It's wonderful to see you, your family, and our honored guests. The last time this event took place, as Mark mentioned, was in 2019, and it was here in Cambridge for the very first time. And I recall what a pleasure it was to host all of you in person. So this year we mark yet another first as we celebrate the new Prataba M. Singh scholars in an online event. As with so much of life nowadays, blending the physical and the virtual makes it possible to enrich the event with participation from near and far. I'm very pleased to see all of you and thank you for joining us. I want to congratulate the newest recipients of the Prataba M. Singh Cambridge Scholarship, Mr. Ashurbad Nayak and Mr. Nikhil Purohit, and to recognize Prataba, Maninder, and their family's support for the Faculty of Law at Cambridge. We're very grateful. The wonderful opening slideshow of previous year's events serves to remind us just how well established and important these scholarships have become in only eight short years. Pratipa's generous benefaction has made it possible for outstanding Indian students to study at our Faculty of Law. I know we're all looking forward to hearing from some of these scholars a little later in the program as they share their experiences with us. I'm sorry that I'm going to have to leave because I have to host another meeting, so I'll have to catch up a little bit later. I'm pleased to note that the director of the LLM course, Professor Henning Rus, Rus Khan, joins us here today. He shares with Prataba a specialization and keen academic interest in IP law. For over 700 years, the Cambridge Faculty of Law has produced exemplary legal scholars of an outstanding caliber. Prataba Singh is one of our remarkable graduates, having undertaken a Master of Laws degree in 1992. She was one of India's leading intellectual property litigators and was designated senior advocate by the Delhi High Court in 2013, the very first time an intellectual property practitioner had been elevated to this role. And as you know, since May 2017, she's been a judge in the Delhi High Court. She's made significant contributions to academic literature and legal developments in Indian intellectual property law, both as a practicing lawyer and as an advisor to several legislative committees. It's gratifying that the Pratiba M. Singh Cambridge Scholarships enable exceptionally talented Indian law students to follow in her academic and professional footsteps. Including this year's new recipients, 15 of these scholarships have been awarded to date. Cambridge takes great pride in the scholars' hard work and accomplishments. 
We know how grateful these exceptional young people are to Prataba for creating opportunity and for opening doors that will indeed transform their future. In turn, they'll go on to shape the landscape of Indian law and beyond. I'm sure that this year's recipients will likewise justify the expectations that we have of them as Pratibha M. Singh Cambridge scholars. We'll watch them all with great interest as they make their undoubted impact in the legal world in the years to come. Thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Pratibha and family. Back to you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Um, well, it's a great pleasure uh, now to introduce um, Justice Pratibha Singh. Um, it's, it's wonderful to see you, uh, Pratibha. Um, and on behalf of the faculty, I would just like to reiterate the thanks that uh, Stephen has expressed. Um, and we all look forward now to, to hearing from you. A very good evening to all of you. Thank you, Professor Elliott, for the kind introduction. Uh, Mr. Fali Nariman, Professor Toop, the Vice Chancellor, all dignitaries from Cambridge, dignitaries in India, dear scholars, their friends and family, ladies and gentlemen, and not to miss my own family. I would like to start by saying that legal education in India has transformed in the last 30 years. This is a very well known fact that previously law was not a very sought after profession. And only those people who didn't get into medicine or engineering chose to do law in India. The only exception to that was people like Fali, who chose to do law and have excelled and have become living legends today. With the introduction of the five-year law course, one of the most sort of, law has become one of the most sought after professions. And I have in fact come across several students who've got into medicine, engineering at the IITs as well, who've now decided to pursue law. One might wonder what is the purpose of a postgraduate degree in law? Is it necessary for being a good lawyer? No, it's not. While there are exceptions like Fali amongst us, I think that a postgraduate education in law broadens the vision of a lawyer, gives the necessary exposure, and also instills in you the spirit to excel among extremely competent peers from various countries. As Indian society and economy moves on, our focus on merely educating people has to change. It has to focus on quality education, leading up to greater innovations with the spirit to excel. It's only with the spirit to excel that countries can progress from developing countries to the developed countries, which is what India aspires to be. My own life would have been completely different if not for the postgraduate scholarship, which I got to study in Cambridge. My family could not have afforded the LLM education. The Cambridge Trust came as a Santa Claus to me and enabled me to pursue LLM in 91, 92. For this, I'm eternally grateful. It is that gratitude which is the seed of this scholarship. In 2013, when Mr. Maninder Singh was to turn 50, this is a story all of us are aware of who have attended past events. It was actually his idea to institute a charitable trust based on our family's name. It's his father's name. And with the blessings of elders in the family, we've set up this charitable trust to promote excellence in education for lawyers. I, it would be completely uh, wrong on my part or, or to say that I should gratefully acknowledge the partnership which was extended by the then Vice Chancellor, Professor Borjevich, in setting up this scholarship and making the scholarship possible. It was him and his team who we worked with almost for more than a year to be able to arrive at how to structure the scholarship. And since then, we've had more than 50, about 15 students who acquired the scholarship. The purpose of the scholarship is threefold. Firstly, to recognize merit. Secondly, to give access to those who are in financial need. And thirdly, to award those students and lawyers who wish to come back to India and contribute to the profession in India. As we speak today, it gives me enormous pleasure to announce that most of these objects have been fulfilled. 
13 out of the 15 students who acquired the scholarship have already come back to India. They're already working in law firms and they're doing litigation practice and they are contributing in their own way to the legal profession. It is the fervent hope that these scholars would raise the standards in the legal profession and also give back to society in future. On the, the trust is actually deeply gratified by the presence of Mr. Fali Nariman. I don't think I can use any better terminology for him apart from saying that he's a living legend in Indian law. He would be addressing the students on the topic of striving for excellence. This topic was chosen for Fali sir with the intention to inspire young students and scholars to strive not merely for monetary and professional growth, but for excellence. We look forward to hearing from you, sir, today. Several of you may have attended the previous events of the scholarship held in Delhi between 2014 to 18. In 2019, Professor Toop was gracious to host us in Cambridge for the scholarship event. Today, on the occasion of the eighth year of awarding the scholarship, I would wish to remember Mr. Arun Jaitley, who's been a mentor, a philosopher, and a pillar of strength to this trust and its endeavors. We continue to miss him. I would like to thank Professor Tandon, Dr. Nikhil Tandon, Justice Kerr, Justice Sikri, Justice Lalit, Justice Bhatt, Justice Thakur, and all of the respected senior judges and dignitaries from government who've graced this occasion. The Professor Eilish Ferrin, I would like to men me mention specifically. The scholars, I've interacted with them on Saturday and it was wonderful to meet them, to see them from nervous young students and lawyers who have grown into extremely competent professionals. My message to the scholars, Mr. Prasit Pranit Kulkarni and Sharat Ninan Matthew of the 2020 batch is that you were there in a pandemic year. Hope you enjoyed your time in Cambridge and made good friends. And this is a commendable achievement to have completed it during the COVID-19 pandemic. For the scholars of this year, Nikhil Puroit and Ashirbad Naik, enjoy your time in Cambridge, make the most of every minute that you're there and bring back good memories with the spirit to excel. With these words, I would like to hand the baton back to Professor Elliot. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Pratibha, for those really inspiring um, words. And certainly as somebody who many years ago came to Cambridge to study law and found the whole experience transformative. Um, I wholeheartedly endorse what you just said about the, the value um, of, of studying at a university um, like Cambridge. Well, it's a pleasure now to uh, introduce our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Nikhil Tendon, uh, who is going to explain something about the scholarship uh, selection process. Thank you. Um... Mr. Fali Nariman, Chief Guest for today's function, uh, Professor Toop, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mark Elliott, the Chair of the Faculty of Law at Cambridge, Ms. Helen Pennant, Director of the Cambridge Trust, uh, Professor Bruce Khan, Professor of International and European Intellectual Property Law, my very close and dear friends, Justice Pratibha Singh and Mr. Maninder Singh, whose munificence has led to the creation of this very coveted scholarship. Uh, scholars from before and now, ladies and gentlemen, it has been a real pleasure for me to be associated with this scholarship and the process of selection of scholars. As someone who's been privileged to be a part of the journey of the scholarship right from its very inception, it gives me immense pleasure to see the significant contribution that this scholarship is providing to support meritorious students aspiring to become well-rounded legal professionals. A bit about the selection process now. As several of you would be aware, we in Delhi have provided a list from the University of Cambridge with names of students who've been offered provisionally admission to the course of LLM pending administrative and financial procedure. This long list is then converted to a short list by us, primarily based on a scholastic merit and uh, also on the diversity of their experience and exposure and skills which they've, uh, which they've acquired uh, during their uh, law degrees. It is these shortlisted candidates who are then called for interview, uh, which till recently was obviously uh, either in person or virtual, 
But for the last couple of years, we've been compelled by circumstances to have this interaction virtually. All these years, the interview panel has actually consisted of just two people. Pratibha, uh, understandably so, justifiably so, she checks all the boxes. And me, a medic, whose very presence actually raises proverbial eyebrows and actually quite often throws the interviewee off track because they don't really expect this ectopic presence on the interview board. Let me also use this occasion to try and explain, possibly justify my presence on the interview panel. Um, I possibly check three boxes. I've been a beneficiary of education at the University of Cambridge as a graduate student uh, in a life gone by. I've been a beneficiary of a scholarship through the Cambridge, we used to call it the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust in those days. And thirdly, I have a daughter who's just become a lawyer. So I think these three things make me a very suitable candidate to be on the interview panel. And I can allay all anxiety and fears of past and future interviewees that they are meeting somebody kosher. One of the most rewarding parts of education at Cambridge for me was being part of an ecosystem which provides a very, very significant breadth of exposure. So while I learned loads of immunology and autoimmune thyroid disease and other stuff which is related to my PhD dissertation, I also learned a lot about a range of other areas, whether it was economics, Egyptology, or engineering. And all this happened by sheer dint of interaction with fellow graduate students during convivial evenings in the MCR. I therefore believe that a mind receptive to knowledge without boundary would benefit maximally from the Cambridge experience. Hence, I often end up being the person on the panel who probes and ascertains whether an applicant is only informed about law is, or is also knowledgeable about law. And the latter includes nuances extending beyond the narrow confines of principles of law to their application and relevance in the context they're being viewed and implemented, which is a slightly different thing than knowing all the rules and regulations of which there are plenty. It gives me immense pleasure to say that the cohort of scholars that we have selected, including those who are recipients of the scholarship in 2021, have demonstrated that they're not merely informed, but also knowledgeable. Reassuring the selection panel that they will gain significantly from their stint at Cambridge. And here, when I use the word Cambridge, I just don't only mean the faculty of law, I also mean their college, and I also mean the university as a whole, and that this experience will make them better equipped to perform as custodians of law, when as Pratibha mentioned, we expect when they return to India and enrich the community of lawyers here. I'd like to end by taking this opportunity to extend my congratulations to the exceptional young men and women who have made us proud by accepting our offer of scholarship. I would also like to congratulate their families, their teachers, their friends and peers, all of whom indubitably have contributed to their success. I hope that this will be an enriching experience for them as it has been for their predecessors. And we look forward to the return as well-rounded professionals who will continue to shine in their future careers. Thank you so much. Let me hand the mic back to Mark. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Um, our next guest uh, is Helen Tennant uh, from the, the Cambridge Trust, and we're going to hear more from Helen um, about uh, the scholarships and um, the, the institutional benefits of, of those scholarships. Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be able to connect with you all uh, today to talk about these wonderful scholarships and the wonderful recipients. Um, this... Uh, uh, is, is a scholarship offered in partnership between the Cambridge Trust and the Sardar Manmo and Singh Charitable Trust. And as speaking from the, the Cambridge Trust, we're extremely proud of this partnership. Um, it began in 2014 and um, the, the inaugural event held at the National Law University in Delhi, I think was on one of the slides beginning this, this event. And um, the first recipient, Miss Siriam Deepika, has been a wonderful um, uh, 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 role model for um, the scholars that have followed her. 
And um, I, I would like to say something about the value of this scholarship. Very often the recipients are um, uh, extremely emotional when they accept the scholarship and say, uh, like uh, Justice Singh, she, she's just said it actually changed her life when she got a, a scholarship to do her own Masters of Law um, in, uh, uh, in the 1990s. They, they, say, they say, well, this, this is going to change my, my life and that's absolutely wonderful to hear. And that is a life-changing um, benefit to the individual made possible by the uh, generosity of Justice Singh and her family and the uh, 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 trust that she has founded. Um, but it's also more than that. So the, the scholarship removes the financial barriers for uh, the recipients to take up their places at Cambridge. Um, but it, it also um, gives them access to um, a wide network which is supportive to them um, during their studies and also importantly, particularly for this scholarship, on graduation and it becomes part of their own professional networks and this again is a form of generosity from our founder Justice Singh in that she is personally involved in celebrating the achievements of the scholars and also in helping them to launch their professional careers on, on graduation and I have to say that that's, that's rare and extremely valuable, um, you know, almost equally so than, than the funding, I, I would say. Um, the value of funding enables the students to take up their places, but it also enables them on graduation to freely pursue their careers. Um, you note that they have all returned to India so far, um, and, and this, this is, this is um, also important. Um, they're not burdened by paying back a, an expensive debt in a foreign currency, but they're able to return to India to um, contribute to the profession and give back to society, as Justice Singh ha has said. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to remember that the wider impact of the scholarship beyond simply the individual um, recipient. Um, the other important benefit, which this very event today is an example of, is, is in spreading the word. So um, uh, Professor Elliot has said it's so valuable to be able to um, uh, have access to the wonderful um, uh, facilities and stimulating environment at, at Cambridge. And we'd like more people to, to feel that they can apply. And um, this event with, with an enormous number of participants is, is, is one way in which this scholarship is widening the pool of talent uh, attracted to Cambridge. And we're all extremely grateful um, for that. And for the, 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 the efforts in between the selection process that um, uh, Professor Tandon and, and Justice Singh um, are, are, they're very active in promoting um, the opportunity of study at Cambridge. Um, I think that um, you, you've had a taste of the, uh, the, the selection process from Professor Tandem, but I mean, I'd just like to give you a few numbers here that um, this, uh, the, the shortlist mentioned by Professor Tandon is drawn from over 4,000 applicants. That's across all subjects. There's an enormous number of qualified people apply for scholarships at Cambridge and, and um, very few get them. So I think, the recipients that we're celebrating today have a lot to be proud of. Not only did they uh, um, gain admission to one of the most competitive courses in one of the most competitive universities, but on top of that, have been additionally selected for a scholarship through a very rigorous um, process. So I would um, like to um, congratulate all the previous recipients who may be on the, the line today and our two most recent, number 14 and 15 in the, in the cohort, uh, Mr. Nikhil Purohit and Ms. Nayak Ashirabad. And it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to Cambridge and, um, and my warmest thanks once again to Justice Singh and her family. And now I'll pass back to Professor Elliot. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, Helen. And um, I echo uh, those words of congratulation uh, as we now turn to hear uh, from um, our current uh, scholars and also the scholars, the scholars who's, uh, who were here um, last year as well. So we're going to begin uh, by hearing from the new scholars and then we'll move on to uh, those who held the scholarships uh, last year. And I'll let each, each of those people um, introduce themselves as we uh, go through. Good afternoon, everyone, to whoever is joining from the United Kingdom, and a very good evening to everyone who's back in India. My name is Ashurbad Nayak, and I'm one of the, the Pratibhamsin scholars for this year. Uh, I was asked to speak for a few minutes today, uh, but my words cannot justify the gratitude I have for Justice Singh and her family for what they have done for me. Neither do I have the elegance of all the other dignitaries, nor do I have the insight of the other three scholars who are supposed to follow me. So instead, I'll just share three things that are important to me and three stories about them. Uh, so the first thing uh, that is important to me is how we influence others and how others influence us. So it was Diwali over here a few days ago. And I remember one of my housemates, uh, Fiona, she asks me, oh, it's Diwali, but you seem to be missing home a little bit. And I was because I miss the fragrance of those diyas being lighted. I miss those firecrackers. I miss those exchange of sweets that take place all the time in India. So a few hours later, it's evening. I hear a knock on my door. I open it and there's Fiona with a string of fairy lights and a box of Cadbury chocolates. And that is exactly how I want to make others feel. The second thing that is important to me is what do I leave behind? So I took a tour around most of the colleges of Cambridge. It was a guided tour. So we stop in front of Gonville and Keys, and the tour guide tells us, oh, this is the college of Stephen Hawking. We stop in front of St. Catherine's College, which is my college, and we are informed Mr. Haryavan Shrai Bachchan studied over here. He studied English literature, and he goes back to India and he writes Hindi poetry. We stop in front of Trinity, and then we see an apple tree, and they tell us this is the college of Sir Isaac Newton. So at that point, I realized there comes a time where the place is known by you rather than you being known by the place. And I think it can perhaps be best demonstrated by this particular scholarship itself that the Justice Pratibha M. Singh Cambridge Trust, Trust Scholarship has as much importance as the Cambridge LLM program to an Indian applicant and to an Indian student. And the final thing that is important to me is how we feel inside. I remember it was just a couple of weeks into Cambridge. I had just gotten out of quarantine. I was missing my family a little bit. Transitioning into a new country is a bit difficult. I took a walk to this park called Fens Causeway over here. And I want you all to picture it, to paint that portrait in your mind of a lovely little brook of water floating by. There's a wonderful bench. I'm sitting there with a the friends. It, it, it's autumn. The leaves are strewn all around me. And in that moment, she asks me, how do I feel? And I tell her, there's beauty all around me, but more importantly, there's gratitude within me. And that is something that I aspire to have every day. Gratitude towards what life's given me and gratitude towards what life has to offer. So whatever it is that we seek, whatever it is that we seek to leave behind, how it is we influence others and how it is that we feel inside to that, I say amen, and to that, I say God bless. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, ma'am. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Nikhil, Nikhil Purohit. I'm one of the recipients of the scholarship this year. And uh, good evening and good afternoon to all the uh, panelists as well as attendees over here. Uh, it feels a little more difficult to go after Ashit Bhatt's poetic remarks, but I'll still... Uh, give it a try to explain and express my views and emotions. So five years ago in 2016, when I entered law school as a student full of self-doubt, I didn't even dare to dream of applying for a master's and that too at the University of Cambridge. In the year 2020, I dared to take the leap and applied for the master's, something which my parents were extremely proud of, irrespective of the result. To my delight and significant surprise, I received the LM offer from Cambridge. However, I didn't react as much since I knew that while it was a significant feat, 
I couldn't take the offer up unless I get the scholarship. Fast forward to July 26, 2021. Five days before the deadline for completing my offer conditions for the LLM. I'd come to terms with the fact that those who've received the scholarship have been informed about the same and I haven't received one. And thus I'll have to give up the offer. And then suddenly late in the evening, I received an email from the trust informing me that I've received the scholarship. My first reaction was not of joy or excitement, but of utter disbelief. I thought I was either re wrongly reading the rejection email as an acceptance one, or someone pulled an elaborate prank on me. And only after thoroughly verifying that I have indeed received the scholarship, the realization hit me that it has actually happened. And at that, and that time, the smiles on the faces of my parents, who are my biggest source of strength, were definitely much wider than mine. And this dream of studying at Cambridge wouldn't have been realized without the utmost support of my peers and supervisors at college, work, and outside. The biggest thank yous, though, remain reserved for the Sardar Manmohan Singh Charitable Trust, the Cambridge Trust, Dr. Tandon, Mr. Maninder Singh, and Justice, Justice Pratibha Singh. For if not for their support, this would have remained a story that could never reach its conclusion. The scholarship brings with it the honor of being a part of an inspiring community of scholars that Justice Singh treats his family. At the same time, it brings a sense of responsibility stemming from the faith that is bestowed upon me. And this responsibility, I believe, is especially important to keep note of this year as the privilege of receiving the scholarship comes amidst the challenging times of the pandemic. Hence, in my one month at Cambridge thus far, it is this sense of responsibility that has pushed me to challenge myself to do my best and to derive the maximum learnings possible. And I conclude with the hope to transfer and apply these learnings to India after the completion of the LLM and to one day help open doors that the scholarship has opened for me for those who do not even dare to knock on them. Thank you, Justice Singh and the Trust. Distinguished dignitary from the dais, friends, family, and well-wishers tuning into the ceremony, a very warm good afternoon slash good evening to all of you. I am one of the scholars from the last year, and today I have been given the opportunity to share my experiences with you. I will share three experiences. I begin with the interview process. One thing that still stays with me from the interview is that I knew that I was being listened to. Justice Singh and Dr. Tandon were not sitting on the panel with an intention to showcase their vast expanse of knowledge. It was definitely not an exercise of, you avoid all the traps we set for you in the interview, and then we will give you the scholarship. They simply wanted to know me for the person that I was. This gave me the motivation to express myself honestly and confidently. The level of attention and honest interaction I got from the panel gave me much needed reinforcement that I'd made the correct decision in deciding to teach law for my career. I remember remarking to my parents after the interview that just the process of attending this interview is something that I will cherish in life regardless of the result. The second experience I'd like to share with you, and this one is very close to my heart, is receiving the news of the result. The moment shall remain one of the best experiences of my life since I received the news on my mother's birthday. My brother and I were waiting outside the cake shop when I got the message. I remember rushing back to the house with the cake and yelling at the top of my voice that I actually received the scholarship. Since I'm fortunate to have a mother who finds most joy in life from good things happening to her children, the scholarship news also became the best birthday gift I have given her till date. The final experience that I share today is how the scholarship impacted my time at Cambridge. Everyone who comes to Cambridge is talented and at least reasonably hardworking. However, not everyone has the privilege to follow what they like or even give their 100% to the course. I have friends who started applying for jobs the moment they arrived in Cambridge till exams week. The time and mental effort it takes for applying to hundreds of jobs and facing rejections in the pandemic-ridden job market should not at all be underestimated. The scholarship gave me freedom from the associated stress, considering I did not have the financial liability normally associated with Cambridge. This privilege and the time it gave me meant that I had the freedom to choose subjects that I like studying and not ones that were calculated to increase my employability. I had the time to do my readings before classes while still chilling with friends 
and going on tours to places in and around Cambridge. I even had the time and mental space to go from couch potato to being able to run a 5K. To sum it up, at the end of the course, one of my favorite professors in Cambridge, after in a house party that he was hosting, how we managed to survive Cambridge in the middle of a pandemic. I replied honestly and confidently that I did not survive, I thrived. I thank the Sardar Manmohan Singh Trust for enabling this. Thank you all. Good evening and good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, my name is Pranit Kulkarni. I was a scholar with Sharath last year. So I have been asked to share my experience and speak a few words on how uh, I spent my time in Cambridge. So in fact, today's event compels me to recount an important inflection point in my life. And that was the 7th of August, 2020, when I received the notification that I had been granted the Pratibha Singh Scholarship. So immediately, all of, all of a sudden, a lot many things started rushing through my mind. First of all, I, was, I think I was at my place. I was just about to go to the bank, complete some loan formalities. And here comes the email saying that, you know, your financials have been uh, guaranteed. You just have to pack your bags and you have to come to Cambridge. First of all, I was relieved that, that I did not have to make the journey to the bank in what was a punishing Mumbai weather that day. And secondly, and most importantly, it was the fact that I was going to Cambridge on this very prestigious Pratibha Singh scholarship. Cambridge this year definitely was very different compared to the previous years. The pandemic hurled a lot of hurdles as well as uh, a lot of issues, of course. And it, it was a time of uncertainty, rather, I'll say. But I must thank Professor Henning Grosrus Khan, who was the LLM director for us as well, and who's one of the panelists over here, for stepping up and being that fountain of support whenever we needed it all throughout. I also took the international IP law course, which he was teaching. And I had the privilege of having my research on Indian copyright law integrated into the course curriculum by him. In fact, it was him who encouraged me to present it before a Cambridge classroom. And I must say that was an overwhelming feeling. Here I was right out of law school, present advocating my point of law before a class filled with brilliant minds from across the globe. I must also thank Professor Bentley with whom uh, I had the opportunity of assisting on his upcoming edition of Intellectual Property Law book. And this was a book which I had to I had referred to during my undergrad days back in India. So it was quite a special occasion for me. Apart from that, I think Cambridge is not just about the confines of the classrooms or the academic exercise. It is way beyond that. In fact, a historic town as Cambridge, it I, I was actually fortunate as a history lover myself to roam around Cambridge through all those streets, uh, explore every nook and corner where history had been written, like Ashirabad rightly pointed out. Also, I had the privilege of rowing for Wolfson, that is my college. So I enjoyed all those early morning rowing sessions, although albeit with a lot of complaints, but I thoroughly enjoyed all those early morning sessions and finally got to row for Wolfson in the row, annual rowing regatta. It's just been over a month and a half since I have returned but I think everyone would agree over here that as difficult as it is to get into Cambridge, it is even more difficult to get Cambridge out of you. And as Mr. Fali Nariman mentions in his famous autobiography, that there's something known as the finishing canter before coming to a standstill. I think that is something which I'm experiencing at the moment. But coming to stand, come to standstill is something which I must and must carry on with the next chapter of my life. All of this wouldn't have been possible without the support of Justice Pratibha Singh and his scholarship. Of course, this scholarship transgresses way beyond Cambridge. As someone who's interested in litigation, the initial years are arduous and tough. So definitely there's, some, there's a lot of freedom which I have on my hands that I can only focus on my litigation without worrying about how, how should I clear my debts for the LLM program. So thank you, Justice Singh. Uh, thank you, uh, Maninda, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tandon, the Cambridge Trust, as well as the law faculty for investing in my vision and agreeing to support me. I hope to follow your footsteps, ma'am. And as and when it's able for me, I hope to help someone who's as needy as I was last year. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to all of the scholars that we've heard from there. It's really great to hear uh, what a huge difference these scholarships um, make. 
Um, there were so many wonderful things that we heard there. It's hard to pick out particular points, but a, a real highlight for me actually was hearing Sarat say how the scholarship had allowed him to study the things that really interested in him, that really interested him, rather than having to worry about what their sort of um, relevance might be in career terms and, and so on. And I think that really demonstrates what a, a wonderful alignment there is between what we try to do in the faculty uh, and what these uh, scholarships do, which is to allow students to really pursue law uh, as an intellectual discipline um, for its own sake, uh, as well as for any, uh, anything that that might uh, lead to. And so it's really great to, to hear this. So I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Professor Henning Grosserusa Khan, who is Professor of IP Law in the Faculty um, and also Director of our LLM programme. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, and it was great to, to hear from all the scholars. And in particular, of course, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from Pranit uh, and uh, that he enjoyed the, the course despite the difficulties the pandemic brought long last year, which we luckily this year don't have to face, at least not to the same extent. Let me begin by saying a few words on the LLM at Cambridge. So every year we receive about 1,200 or more applications. We run a competitive selection process and eventually allow between 150 and 200 students from over 50 jurisdictions often or more from around the world to gather at Cambridge for an intense and highly enriching one year Masters of Law program with around 25 or more different papers on offer. And next to the excellent academic conditions and resources, as well as our world-class academic staff, a very key, if not the key element of success of the Cambridge LLM are you, the students, by bringing rich and diverse experiences from your own home countries from your cultures and from your legal traditions into our program. So as an IP lawyer, let me also say a little bit about the study of intellectual property law at Cambridge and in the LLM, not least because I know that this is a topic close to the heart of Justice Pradeep uh, M. Singh. So at Cambridge, uh, we have a strong and proud tradition on intellectual property research and study, which is now reflected in the Center of, uh, for Intellectual Property and Information Law, CIPL, but also the Center for Law, Medicines and Life Sciences, LML, and further reflected in several high profile IP experts, as well as a lot of promising postdocs and PhD students working on IP law and information law and master students definitely included. Cambridge excellence in IP is also reflected in the range of papers on the master's program in this field. So we have an IP law course, which looks at domestic and European Union, intellectual property developments and intellectual property law. We have an international intellectual property law course, which I teach. We have a course on information law. We have a course in law and medicine. So we have a range of courses, which overall offer you further to obtain a specialized LLM with a designation in IP law when sufficient number of these courses are on offer. I can just add that my own paper on international intellectual property law, in that I have for many years been able to rely on great examples from India in particular, as a country which has established a great tradition for its own specific approach to intellectual property. Look at the Novartis case, look at the Delhi University copyright case, and so on and so forth. A tradition which many argue has not only the interests of IP owners, but also those of IP users and the general public in mind. So very much a good model to look at. Finally, let me just close with a very, very big thank you to Justice Singh for bringing excellent talent to the Cambridge LLM via your scholarships. And thank you for the talent that I personally have been able to benefit from in many of my courses. With that, I hand back to Professor Elliot and thank you again very much. Thank you, Hannah. Well, it's a real honor now to be able to introduce our chief guest, Mr. Fanny S. Nariman. Um, I think that for virtually everybody, probably every single person on this call, um, he requires no introduction uh, whatever. So I'll just say a few very brief things. Um, as we're all aware, 
Uh, Mr. Nariman is one of India's most distinguished lawyers and jurists. Among his many, many distinctions over a decade long career, um, he has served um, as a senior advocate in the Supreme Court of India, as president of the Indian Bar Association, as president of the Law Association for Asia and the Pacific, and as chair of the executive committee of the International Commission of Jurists. It's an enormous privilege that, uh, that we can hear from uh, Mr. Nariman uh, this afternoon. Um, and we look forward very much to hearing from him uh, on the topic of striving for excellence. Thank you. Thanks uh, to the marvels of digital video technology. It has been my great pleasure to see at long distance, as well as to listen to the Vice Chancellor of Cambridge University, Professor Stephen Toop, Professor Mark Elliott, who very kindly introduced me, Justice Pratibha Singh, Judge High Court of Delhi, who is solely responsible for my presence here, Dr. Nikhil Tandon, Mrs. Helen Pennant, Director of the Cambridge Trust, Professor Henning Rus Khan, and the scholars of 2020 and of 2021, all four of them, whom I was very pleased to hear, and each of whom I offer my very warm congratulations and best wishes for the future. My only regret is that currently digital video technology for all it professes is not advanced enough to enable me to see my real audience who are fellow students of law because I call them fellow students because we are all, each of us, students of law for the rest of our lives. I hope they will be able to, we will be able to hear, they will be able to hear what I have to say. But first, a word about Pratiba and her dear and scholarly husband, Maninda, who have been old friends of Betsy and myself for many years. Pratiba deserves the heartiest congratulations for instituting these scholarships. And she must be really proud after listening to the four scholars. Will Durant, the American historian, writes somewhere that education is the technique for transmitting civilization. And I thank you, Pratiba, for your signal contribution to the transmitting of civilization year by year, which must be a matter of great pride and pleasure to you. Now a few words on the subject. In India, striving for excellence in the law can only be achieved by striving for and achieving some degree of proficiency in the language of the law. In colonial times, for over 200 years, English as spoken and as written in British India had always been looked upon as a foreign language, but no longer. English has now become a language that we in independent India have deliberately adopted as our own by choice. As 53 other 
independent nations of the Commonwealth have done. 53 plus India constitute today the common law countries of the world. Institutions established by and under India's constitution are all mirrored on a system established in England many, many centuries ago. And the concepts enshrined in our constitution, concepts like justice, liberty, equality, are Anglo-Saxon, both in origin and content. And the constitution of ours has declared English to be one of the only two official languages of India. So in India, as in the rest of the Commonwealth, language and law are the most closely interlinked and interrelated. Therefore, to excel in the law in India, must, one must first and foremost <coughs> be proficient in the knowledge of English, a rich and ever-growing language, which at the same time is full of roadblocks and difficulties. To say all this is not to compel you students of law to be, become anglicized. Far from it. <laughs> it is only to give you an opportunity to establish yourself and to be able to strive to be successful in the, in the law. <laughs> Felix Frankfurter is the name of a sitting judge of the United States of America in the 1940s, familiar to many, if not all of you. He was a judge whom India's constitutional advisor, Mr. B. N. Rao, had consulted after he had drafted a constitution for India. But Justice Frankfurter is also famous for another reason. Way back in 1954, a 12-year-old American student living in Alexandria, Virginia, wrote a letter to the judge saying he was interested in going into law as a career and he sought the judge's advice. Frankfurter's advice to the young man interested in going into law is now in the public domain for all to read. <coughs> His advice was, and I quote, the best way to prepare for the law is to come to the study of the law as a well-read person by acquiring the capacity to use the English language on paper and in speech. <coughs> you will find Frankfurter's advice to a law student set out in a book which has the title the world of law. The book is in two volumes, the law in literature and the law as literature. <coughs> it was published nearly 60 years ago. In these volumes, you will find extracts from English literature, <coughs> essays, opinions, stories, records of famous trials, meticulously and very usefully compiled by a distinguished English constitutional lawyer, Mr. Ephraim London. When you read and digest the information contained in these two volumes, you students of law, or shall I say fellow students of law, will be able to say proudly that you are Frankfurter trained in the law. Apart from keeping yourself informed and being up to date with Indian case law, <clears throat> like decisions of the Supreme Court of India and of high courts, particularly your own high court in whichever state you are located. Important thing is, as Frankfurter said, stocking your mind with good reading of English literature. My leader, Sir Jamsaji Kanga 
was a doyen of the Bombay Bar. It was in his chambers that I commenced my practice of law in Bombay in 1950, the year of our constitution, till I moved to Delhi in 1972. So Jamsaji Kanga used to tell us that he had little work in the first few years of his 60 year long practice at the bar. In those days, back in the 1920s, there was far less work for juniors than there is today. He told us that in his early days, he spent his time reading all the then current decisions of the Privy Council, which he could cite by heart and of Indian high courts. But during the day, he would sit in various courts, seeing and listening and thereby learning how to argue, but what is more important, how not to argue, simply by observing other lawyers present their cases in court. The next important thing in the law is a willingness to learn from one's mistakes, cultivating a cult of humility. It was way back in the 17th century that Oliver Cromwell, Lord Protector of England, used to tell his constituents, I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. I beseech you in the bowels of Christ, think it possible you may be mistaken. I mentioned this quote because you will find it has been very frequently used in judgments of Justice Krishna Iyer, who sat in India's Supreme Court with great distinction, judging cases from the year 1973 to 1980, years that are today reckoned to be the golden years of India's Supreme Court. If you take up the practice of law, whether in a court, in court or in an office, you will find you will often be mistaken in your views or in your assessment of men and matters. And a small step towards excellence in the law is to be able to admit to and rectify the mistakes you may have made. Besides, we lawyers, not just in India, but elsewhere, are by habit loquacious. We talk too much. A favorite speaker of mine, Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, recently told his audience, my father used to say, don't raise your voice. Instead, improve your argument. It's always better. Years ago, I read an article written by an American lawyer advising his younger brethren on how to argue in the appellate court. There were about 20 very useful hints. And the last one was, sit down. For me, this has remained the best piece of advice to a young practicing lawyer in court. Talk less, devote more thought to the case at hand. Listen and learn from senior brethren speaking in court and outside court. Lessons in advocacy are often imbibed from the great and successful. Quinton Hogg, a familiar name, later Lord Hailsham, Lord Chancellor of England in the 1970s and 1980s writes in his autobiography, A Sparrow's Flight, about the very useful lesson on advocacy that he, then a totally inexperienced pupil at the bar, learned from the then master of the role, Sir Wilfred Green. Quinton Hogg was sitting next to him one night at dinner when Wilfred Green suddenly asked Hogg, supposing you were instructed in a case where you had two points to argue, both of them bad, but one worse than the other, which would you argue first? And Quinton Hogg, later Lord Elsham said, 
I suppose, sir, I would argue the less bad of the two. Wrong, Green says, wrong. You must argue the worst point and put your very, your very best work in it. And then he went on. Eventually, the judges will drive you into a corner and you will have to admit defeat. You will then say, my Lord, there is another point I am instructed to argue. I am not quite sure how to put it. And then you will put the better of the two arguments, but taking care to put it not quite as well as it could be put or should be put. After a little while, this is Green speaking. After a little while, one of the old gentlemen on the bench will interrupt you and say, but surely, Mr. Green, you might put it this way. And the old gentleman on the bench will put it exactly as you really ought to have put it in the first place. And then, but only then, you will be halfway to winning your case. I've always found this excellent advice in the very difficult art of advocacy. It is an illusion to think that great cases are won or lost because of their inherent strength or weakness. Advocacy plays a crucial, nay, a vital role. And good advocacy consists in how much and how well you have thought about and how ultimately you have presented your case in court. Lastly, to achieve excellence, remember to, that you can be smart, but never too smart. Be smart, but never too smart. In the latest edition of the Oxford Book of Quotations, there is a quote which reads, how much man could have excelled as he, had he chosen to suppress his cleverness rather than indulge in it. How much man could have excelled had he chosen to suppress his cleverness rather than indulge in it. So when success in the profession goes to your head, I'm sure you will forget this quote. But I hope you will remember the following story. And the story goes like this. One night, a Delta twin engine plane is flying somewhere above New Jersey in the United States of America. There are four people on board. The pilot, Bill Gates, the Dalai Lama, and a hippie who had boarded the plane with a backpack. Suddenly, an oxygen generator explodes loudly in the luggage compartment and the passenger cabin begins to fill with smoke. The cockpit door opens and the pilot bursts into the compartment. Gentlemen, he begins, I have good news and bad news. The bad news is we are about to crash in New Jersey. But the good news is that there are three parachutes and I have one of them. With that, the pilot opens the door of the plane and jumps out. Next, Bill Gates gets up and says, Gentlemen, I am the world's smartest man. The world needs smart men. I think the world's smartest man should have a parachute as well. Then he grabs one and out he jumps. The Dalai Lama and the hippie look at each other. Finally, the Dalai Lama speaks. My son, he says, I have lived a satisfying life. I have known the bliss of, and of true enlightenment. You have your li life ahead of you. You take the parachute and I will go down with the plane. The hippie smiles. A sly smile. And he says, don't worry, Pop. The world's smartest man just jumped out wearing my backpack. The moral of this story is, a moral particularly relevant for today's Pratibha Singh scholarship event. Be smart, 
but never too smart and you will excel in whatever you do with this i wish you good luck my fellow students of law and may god be with you thank you thank you very much indeed for those um, inspiring and, and and fascinating remarks we're going to um, conclude this afternoon with a vote of thanks. But before I uh, move to that, um, I just want to reiterate um, thanks from me and from all of my colleagues here in Cambridge, both to everybody who has contributed to this afternoon's event, um, and in particular to our chief guest, uh, Mr. Nariman, and also to Justice Singh and to her family, uh, both for being here today but also for their uh, steadfast support um, over so many years. We've heard directly from the Pratibha M. Singh scholars uh, today about the transformative impact that these scholarships uh, can have. Um, and that is something that is of incalculable value uh, to the law faculty, to the university, and of course, most importantly, to the individual scholars themselves. So on behalf of the, the law faculty and the university, thank you very much from me. And we're now going to conclude uh, today's event with a formal vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor Elliot. Um, on behalf of the Siddharth Manmohan Singh Charitable Trust and the members of my family, I first and foremost extend my sincerest gratitude to Mr. Sunny Nariman, who joined us today despite being so late in the evening here in India and for his just awing remarks and his stories that he shared with us. And I'm sure, sir, they will stay with us. Um, for all the budding boys, I can speak on behalf of all of them. Um, I also thank Professor uh, Stephen Duke for taking time out and greeting us here at this occasion. And I would also express my gratitude to Ms. Pennant for sharing with us the values, the benefits, and the activities that involve uh, in the Cambridge Trust uh, scholarships. And we cherish our partnership with you, ma'am. Uh, a special thanks to Professor Henning, who shared the IP papers with us, especially at LLM, uh, at the LLM course in Cambridge. Um, so there are a lot of students who joined us to, uh, here, who have joined us today here. And especially for those who are going to apply or who wish to apply to the LLM's uh, course at Cambridge, this, these words will stay with us. I also thank Professor Elliot to be here with us today and helped us in moderating this event and he's also the chair at the faculty of law. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, my sincerest regards to Dr. Tandon. Uh, thank you uncle for everything and for supporting us and for being on the panel for choosing this college. And of course, you mentioned the check boxes which are ticked today. Uh, thank you so much. And this vote of thanks would be incomplete without me thanking Ms. Gordon and Ms. Birch, who Ansh and I completely, uh, you know, bolted with emails. And thank you so much for being so patient with us in our emails. And I also thank Mr. Daniel Bates and the IT department at Cambridge, who has actually made this possible for us to get together here and uh, have this virtual event with so many people. Thank you so much, sir. Such an event is never possible without a strong person who's overseeing the administration. So from the Singh and Singh side, our master administrator, Mr. Dabdish Bhatt, I really thank you so much for overlooking everything. Um, I also thank um, Ansh, who is here with us. Uh, he is a Pratibha Hamsing scholar himself, but he has helped us through the activities from coordinating with the shortlisted candidates for the interviews and to the activities for having this event here. Um, I would also thank all the scholars present, with, present here with us today and of course my family members here. Um, lastly, I would like to thank all the dignitaries or off the dais. I, am, I wish I could see all of you, but uh, unfortunately not in this, not this time. But uh, I thank all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Ideally, we would have met in real time in person, but um, we are acclimatizing ourselves to this, which I can safely call is the new normal, which the COVID has created for us. And I'm so grateful that all of us, all of you are here for commending the efforts of the scholars who have made it despite the hardships that they faced um, amidst the COVID pandemic. So thank you so much for coming here. 
and now ordinarily i would have invited you for a high tea after this but uh, unfortunately this year it's not that's not possible um, honestly that is the favorite part um, that i think my favorite part also of the event but hopefully by this time next year we can have all of you and meet all of you in real time here in delhi and um, god willingly we can see you next year but until then thank you so much for joining us today and hope you have a very good day and a very good evening depending on what time zone you are thank you very much thank you sir